that's a good start for the praise hymn. It is, let's just praise the Lord, page 107, and then the first and third verses of 106. And if you're ready, willing, and able, let's stand together as we sing. Let's just praise the Lord with two verses of 106. Morning. Good morning. My name is Glenn, and we want to welcome you to the Union City Cumberland Presbyterian Church for this week of September 22nd, 2024. Just a few announcements this week. First of all, Wednesday night, uh, just our normal fall schedule. You can see the bulletin, or you can ask around for details if you need to know more. Oh, sorry, let's back up. Tomorrow, I just learned uh, at 8:30 in the morning they're going to come here. I don't know that anybody has anything that you're doing here, but tomorrow at 8:30 they're going to be cleaning the carpets all through this area and down the hallway here. Just let you know that in case you've got some activity you were planning to come here to do something, uh, talk to us and, and we'll fix that. Okay, hey, I know some of you guys are uh, active on social media. I try my best not to be, but especially on Facebook, you can support our Helping Hand ministry here in town a lot if you would just like and or follow the Facebook page. It comes up as Helping Hand Ministry, Inc., 501c3. I mean, just rolls off the tongue, you know. I don't know who, you know, I guess that was of necessity. But anyway, here's the thing. That's what it looks like right now as of yesterday. Once you've connected with them, you can really, and I'm not kidding about this, you can really help by liking and sharing their posts, which are usually about things that are for sale in the thrift store over there. It'll uh, help spread the message about what's for sale, get the word out, get people to come from all over the region, you know, that kind of thing. Any special programs we have, it just helps the thrift store uh, to thrive by having more customers and letting people know what's going on. And that leads to more funds so that we can uh, help people. Anyway, just a suggestion for you uh, for an easy way to support that ministry at Helping Hand. Okay, and then don't forget the group called Friends in Mission. And i got to confess, I don't personally know anything about this group. But they're undertaking this mission trip to Mississippi on October 20th to 25th to work on rebuilding homes after last year's tornadoes. Now, both Bill Fry and John Burke are planning to join that trip. 
Maybe you want to join too. All levels of skill are invited. If you think you can join it, you can talk to Bill or to John or just come see me and we can help you get connected and set for that. Now, related to that trip, the session, that's our leadership council in the church, they want to support the guys that are going on this trip. And so they've scheduled, this is a new item, they've scheduled a spaghetti lunch fundraiser to be held Sunday, October 13th, right after worship. And we're going to be asking for donations for that lunch, and we'd love to raise at least $2,000. That's sort of the goal in mind. So please put that on your calendar. It's going to be fun, and it's also, you know, of course, for a great, great cause to support Bill and John, help pay their expenses, but also provide materials, et cetera, for their work. It's Sunday, October 13th. It's three weeks from today, right after worship, and I'm sure we're going to have some more details about that coming soon. Okay? Any more business announcements? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, there is no one like you in heaven or on earth. You alone are worthy of our praise. And so we've come this morning to worship you, to praise your name, to proclaim to the world your power and glory, and to once again affirm that you are our God and that we are your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is new to us, but mm, old as in my age, <laughs> so like 74 years old. That's not my age, but it's close. All right, so the you may know the chorus, but you may not know the verse. So just sort of play along. It's pretty straightforward. And we're going to sing just two verses. It is no secret. And I think it'll, if it doesn't go well today, we'll sing it again next Sunday. All right? And then the next Sunday. If it doesn't, you know, we'll get it. Okay? All right. Y'all don't have to stand on this one. Y'all do. The chimes of time ring out the news. Another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone you? You may have gone for and strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope to you. It is no secret what God can. So on Wednesday night, along with our regular activities, we're going to be in 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 3. Probably 3 to about 12 is the goal. You never know how that goal is going to go, but 
we did pretty good this past week. We got uh, through 1 Peter 1, 13 through 2, 3. So we should be good. We're going to talk about God's holy, uh, being a holy people and what that means uh, more separate than righteous, if you will, uh, as far as the definition you might like to use. Okay? 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 3. Okay? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. If you're able, can't be uh, sung sitting down. All right? You got to stand up. So 481 is where we're going, and we're going to sing all four verses. Stand up, stand up for Jesus.
to the Lord. Almighty God, we come to honor you in this your sanctuary. A reverent supplication, we come before you, presenting our gifts of love to you, the Most High. We await your return with deep anticipation. All honor and glory be thine. Amen. Amen. All right, the choir is going to sing, I'll put on a crown with everybody will be happy over there. And I don't know what pushes me to do this, but today is some, you know, like we've sung songs where you really can't take a good breath. <laughs> well, this one's no different. So, y'all, if we don't breathe up here, y'all breathe for us, okay? I think that might work. I'll put on a crown with everybody will be happy over there.
I got a message from from Martha Jarnigan last night that Paula uh, didn't, the way she put it, Paula didn't rouse at all yesterday. The doctors have so far been unable to determine what's causing her situation, her decline, but it sounds quite serious. So please be in prayer for uh, Paula and, of course, Miss Martha and the family. Uh, and then Miss Barbara Dickerson gave me a note this morning. I'm so thankful for that uh, about Carter Unger. Carter Unger is her great grandson on uh, Will Dickerson's side of the family. He's 12 years old, but he was airlifted to Lebonner yesterday after an MRI diagnosed him with uh, encephalitis. And uh, he's on antibiotics. He's going to have a, a lumbar puncture as soon as they dealt with the dehydration. But uh, that's Miss uh, Barbara's great grandson, Carter Unger. So as God brings that to mind, be praying for him the next few days. Uh, Mary Townsley is still in recovery over at the Waters. She's in room 206, for some of you uh, will want to know that. Uh, can I just tell you, she's, she's struggling. Uh, but keep praying for her to get her strength back, to get her energy. She's just so tired. When I went to see her yesterday, uh, part of that may be the, the meds, right? I mean, I don't know, but she needs our prayers right now. And then we're also praying for the family of uh, Elizabeth Callan. Her son, David Callan, is uh, married to Anna Scott's uh, daughter. Where's Miss Anna? There you are, Angela. And then uh, his brother, Tyree, Elizabeth's one of their other sons. How many sons does she have? Are they just the only two? Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. But anyway, Tyree's the one that helps take care of our church grounds here. He cuts the grass and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, Miss Elizabeth was laid to rest this past Thursday, and so we want to be in prayer for that family as they uh, deal with that. All right, let's go to God. Our dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you this morning with full knowledge that you're the most important person here in this room. And we bow before you in this moment, praising your name and giving thanks for your power and mercy and love. You've given us so many gifts, so many blessings, but nothing compares to the gift of your Son. Not only that he came and gave his life for us, but that now through his spirit, he is with us and within us to live through us. Help us to walk in a way that reflects the calling we've received with humility and patience and love. And teach us to put off our old selves and to let you renew our hearts and minds each day. May we trust you to live through us, shaping our actions and thoughts to reflect your goodness in all we do. We ask that in Jesus' name this morning. Father, you know there are so many for whom we've, we're uh, praying this week. Especially praying for Paula Jernigan. For Miss Martha. We're praying for Carter Unger. Just 12 years old, dealing with these health issues. We pray for Mary Townsley. For the family of Elizabeth Callan in their time of loss. And then, Father, you know there are so several others for whom we've been praying continually. Uh, Ed and Glenda Griffin. Praying for them to get their uh, strength back. We continue to pray for Hugh and especially Miss Winona Wade. Praying for Miss Darlene Westbrook. Her mobility issues, asking strength and healing for her. We pray for Ricky Vaughn, that's Miss Peggy Vaughn's son. Continue to pray for Deborah Blankenship, a, a resident over at the Davy Crockett, but dealing with some very, very serious health issues. We pray for Miss Deborah. Father, in every case, even the ones we didn't mention today, we ask that your will would be done. And then finally, we pray out loud this morning, just as Jesus taught us to pray, as we pray in unison, sang together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the 
glory forever. Okay. If God was going to give you a score for your spiritual life right now, what do you think it'd be for you? Now, let me interject before you think too much about that. The whole message this morning is about the reality that that's not the way God works. Okay. That's not how the gospel works. There's no scorekeeping per se. Okay, and that's really the thrust of the whole message. But having said that, the way people typically think is that God's up in heaven, right? He's floating on the clouds and he's got a big scoreboard. And you did something bad over there. Uh Uh-oh, Mark, Mark. Uh Uh-oh, he did a good thing today. Just as an exercise, how do you think you're doing? If God was going to give you a score, you think that's how it works. It doesn't work that way. Have you been good these last few days? Come on. Are you ashamed of anything that's happened? Anybody want to stand up and tell what you messed up? Some of us this morning? Come on now. Well, look, our message on, uh, today on Paul's letter to the Ephesians comes from a man named Watchman Nee. Now, Watchman Nee was born in China uh, in November of 1903, so over 120 years ago. He was born in Fujian province. Uh, Fujian is a relatively small province, but it's important due to its location. You can maybe see, it's so small, I'm sorry about that. On my computer screen, it looks so big, what's wrong? It's right there next to Taiwan. And so just for reference, uh, morbid reference maybe, uh, if we end up in a war over Taiwan, may God have mercy on the planet. But we can guess that the bulk of the the Chinese effort are going to cross the straits right there from Fujian province. I mean, it's got nothing to do with Watchman Nee. He was just born there 120 years ago. Okay. But Watchman Nee became a Christian when he was, uh, it was 1920. He was just 17 years old. And almost immediately, he had an impact. He got a training to be a minister. He started his own magazines, publishing his own magazines. He wrote books. But he changed his given name to what in English means Watchman Nee, because he felt that was his calling, to be a a kind of watchman on the wall, so to speak, for his countrymen and Christian co-workers there in China. But Nee wrote a book about Paul's letter to the Ephesians entitled, Sit, Walk, Stand. And some of you have told me you went out and bought that book. That's awesome. That's great. Because our message today is really uh, based on the thoughts and the writings of Watchman Nee, especially in this book, Sit, Walk, Stand. A few weeks ago, talking about uh, this A letter to the Ephesians, we tried to make it clear that the Christian experience doesn't begin with walking. It begins with sitting. Not working, not striving, not effort, but just sitting. Sit down and take a rest because God has given us that gift. The work has already been done. By whom? Come on, Jesus, obviously. He's already done all that needs to be done for us to be children of God. See, our problem is we think we need to work in order to earn the right to sit down. Our natural reasoning says, hey, if we don't walk, how are we ever going to reach the goal? We got to, you know, we're trying to reach heaven. What can we achieve without effort? How can we ever get anywhere if we don't move? But that's getting it backwards from the beginning, okay? Christianity begins not with a big do with a big done. Jesus has done everything for us and our need right now is to rest confidently in Him. Do you need to hear that this morning? Maybe you're hurried or uh, worried. (laughs) Maybe you're harried. Okay, I mean you love your kids. You love them. You give your life for them. But if you could just get a few hours of peace, right? You love your spouse, but God help you if they would just something, you fill in the blank, not out loud, come on. Or maybe it's your ex. You don't mind your job, maybe you even like your job, but there's that one guy, man, oh my goodness, or that one woman. Maybe they're above you in the hierarchy, maybe you're above them, but if they would just back off, man. See, Jesus has done everything needed to deal with these kind of things. Sit with that and feel his rest. Okay, then, once we found our strength by sitting and resting and just receiving what God has for us, 
Then we begin to walk. We begin to move. As Nee puts it, sitting describes our position with Christ in the heavenlies. That's our status. Walking is the practical outworking of that heavenly position here on earth. Many of you know uh, Brother Daryl Turner uh, here in town, or you see him tooling around uh, the streets on his uh, scooter. Uh, he can move that thing. Do you guys know that? If you're walking on the sidewalk, you better step aside. But how does he get around? Now listen, this is, uh, I, with all uh, apologies to Brother Daryl, he sits. If he tries to stand while that thing's in motion, there's going to be a disaster. And I think that's happened a few times. God help him. But his forward progress, his safe forward progress, depends upon him remaining seated on that scooter, right? Well, that's a admittedly imperfect picture of the Christian life. Again, apologies to Brother Darrell. But be reminded that our conduct depends a great deal upon our inward rest in Jesus. If we're going to go forward, we start with sitting and then we start to move. Okay, so what does Paul say about all this in Ephesians? How should we walk in our daily lives? Paul says, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness. And then a little later, he says, This I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles, the pagans do, in the futility of their minds, but be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And actually, Paul even goes on. He later says, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Then later, Walk as children of light and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Eight times in this letter, Paul uses the word walk. It literally means, you know, just to walk around. But he's using it here to talk about how we live, how we behave. And so after the first section of the letter, if you've read through the whole letter to the Ephesians, the chapter 1, 2, and 3, where Paul's talking about sitting, our status, okay, now he's talking about the working out of that status. And this entire section, chapter 4, chapter 5, and the first part of chapter 6, we've all been through, that's about our conduct. Okay, so what's the standard for us? Go back to our original question. If we think about how we're doing, if we think God's going to give us a score, he's not, but if we think he's going to give us a score, how might we measure ourselves? How do we know where we are? Anybody here heard of the Sermon on the Mount? Some of you have. It was the teaching Jesus gave probably many times, but at least once while he was literally on a mountainside or up there on the hill. Have you guys read that? Do you remember the kinds of things that Jesus said? This is from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus talking now, not Paul now. We're talking about Jesus. He says, you've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, don't resist an evil person. Wait a minute, is he joking? Don't resist an evil person. He says, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Okay, if you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. What? Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. He says, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy, enemies. You notice he didn't say, don't attack them, restrain yourself. He said, no, man, positively love them. Pray for those who, per who persecute you. I heard somebody just today, uh, this morning, talking about churches ought to have a course on how do you pray and bless those who persecute you. But this is the big one. Jesus says, you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And there's the standard. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The problem is, we think that's impossible, literally impossible. So was Jesus joking? Was he just kind of, you know, trolling us? You know, we think a lot about right and wrong. That's the human condition. Ever since Adam and Eve, we're preoccupied with deciding for ourselves what's good and what's evil. And pagans, man, they've worked out their own standards. It means everybody outside the church, I mean the true church, they think a lot about right and wrong. Don't you know that? Justice versus injustice. And they really do try to live by those standards. Now, they're often 
hypocrites, which is ironic because they think Christians are hypocrites. And the standards are always changing. There's no objective basis for them. But they do try, as best they can, to live in keeping with their own oscillating rules. It changes every week. Who's in and who's out. But for followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters, listen to this, right? You know it. We don't begin with a bunch of rules. What about the Ten Commandments? Nope. That's not our starting place. The commands of Jesus matter. Yes or no? Yes, they matter. But we start with him. It's personal for us, man. His commands mean literally nothing without him. See, that's the problem with Western civilization in a nutshell today. Mark Sayers is always saying this. We, we want the kingdom without the king. We want progress without the presence. We want justice without the judge. No, for the Christian, even the idea of justice, for example, means nothing apart from Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Is it right for somebody to walk up and hit you in the face? Of course not, right? Everybody knows that. It's not right. But the question is, do we only care about what's right? See, as Christians, our standard for living can never be merely, is something right or is it wrong? How do, I, how do we react? Whatever. Our standard for living, brothers and sisters, is the cross. And the principle of the cross is the principle of self-sacrifice. Watchman Nee tells the story of a Christian brother in South China who had a rice field in the middle of a hill he says, quote, in time of drought, he used a water wheel worked by a treadmill to lift water from the irrigation stream into his field. Now, these pictures are from Japan in like the 1880s, uh, but you get the idea, the mechanism that he's talking about. So this Christian uh, had a neighbor. His neighbor had two fields below his, and one night the neighbor made a breach in the dividing bank and drained off all this Christian's water from his field. When the brother repaired the breach and pumped in more water, his neighbor did the same thing again, and this was repeated three or four times. So he consulted his Christian brothers. He said, I've tried to be patient and not to re retaliate, but is it right? And after they prayed together about it, one of them replied, if we only, listen, if we only try to do the right thing, surely we're poor Christians. We have to do something more than what is right. The brother was much impressed, and he says, next morning he pumped water for the two fields below, his neighbors, and in the afternoon pumped water for his own field. After that, the water stayed in his field. His neighbor was so amazed at his action that he began to inquire the reason, and in the course of time, he too became a Christian. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We know that the standard, what the standard is, but sometimes we get things backwards on this. We try really hard, for example, to be humble and gentle, but we somehow don't know what it means to let God work into us the humility and gentleness of Jesus. We try to show love, but we realize we don't have enough, and we ask God to give us more. You just got to give me more love. But then we're surprised when he seriously doesn't seem to give us any. Have you ever had that experience? Imagine a certain person, maybe they're even a Christian, but there's somebody who is always pushing your buttons. Anybody know somebody like that? Don't raise your hand. That's, that's not fair. You know somebody like that. Every time you see them, they do or say something that just makes you nuts, and it bothers you because you say to yourself, man, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to love this guy. I want to love him. And you make the, 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 the decision in your heart. Man, I'm determined to love him. And so you pray as earnestly as you can. Father, please give me love for this guy. I'm telling you, I, almost, I feel like I can't take it. And uh, let me get uh, King James on you. You gird up your loins, okay? And you get yourself all worked up. And you set out with all your willpower. And with a genuine desi desire, man, you're going to display to this guy all the love which you have been asking God to give you to things you've been praying for and then you meet them in the break room at work or sometimes it's in the committee meeting at church or it's in the parking lot or at the restaurant and as soon as you get in the, his presence here he goes again and he pushes your buttons and you're determined to show love and but he may not mean to but it's almost as if he's trying 
to make you nuts, and immediately all that emotion just floods back. And once again, the best you can do is just try and be polite, you know, try and be, hey, okay, okay, get out of there. You don't attack him. You can be polite, but you surely don't have any love for this guy. Okay, why? Is it wrong to seek more love from God, asking for more love to share? No. But as Watchman Nee says, the problem is seeking that love as something in itself. Now listen, when what God desires is to express through us the love of his son. Now friends, this is a high level teaching from Watchman Nee. Please try to hear me. God has given us Jesus. Yes or no? Yes. And there's nothing else for us to receive outside of him. He doesn't give us Jesus, and okay, I'm going to give you a little gentleness too. You get it? He doesn't give us Jesus, and okay, oh, I see you need some patience. Let me give that to you. No, we just need him. And Jesus' own Holy Spirit has been sent to us to produce within us whatever it is that we need. See, sometimes we want things from Jesus when we ought to just want Jesus himself. Our prayers are full of requests for him to do things, but also for him to give us things. And nothing's wrong with that. He invites us to do that. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But sometimes we even, listen, we even seek good things from God in a way that suggests we see God merely as a dispenser of desirable things, right? We love the gifts maybe a little bit more than we love the giver. Even asking for, God, for more of God's love can be done in such a way that belies our assumption that God is here to give us benefits. Hey, uh, I really need to love this guy, so come on, give me what I need so I can do what I think I'm supposed to do. Give me what I need so I can do what I think I'm supposed to do. When in reality, he's already given us the greatest benefit. He's given us the greatest gift. He's given us what we need in Jesus. Friends, I've spent many, many years just crying out for God to give me more love for people. Uh, many of you know that the closer we get to Jesus, uh, somehow the further we can feel from ever attaining that level of love uh, for people that we know ought to flow from us. But men, I don't need God to give me love. I just need Jesus. And he'll love through me. In the Joyful Noise newsletter, and by the way, if you don't get our newsletter every month, uh, if you're interested, give us your uh, mailing address and we'll send you one. But in the newsletter last month for August, I mentioned uh, Anglican Bishop William Temple. He was the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury during World War II. Anyway, he used to, uh, used to explain it this way. He said, quote, It's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it. I can't. And it's no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it. I can't. But if the gen think about this, if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write plays like his. And if the spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live a life like his. Now, think about that difficult person in your life. But this time, just say to God, Father, I realize I can never love this guy in my own power. I can't do it. But I know there's a life that's within me, the life of Jesus, and he can't do anything but love that guy. See, don't exert yourself to love. Just relax in Jesus. Count on him. And then go and, and meet your, uh, your nemesis, your enemy. I hope you don't call him that. But go and then just see how, without any effort, God can work unconsciously. The all-important rule is not to try, but to trust. Not to depend on our own strength or abilities or virtues, but upon his strength and goodness. I want to end this morning, not quite end, but almost end, with the words of Watchman Nee. He says this, quote, now listen to this. He says, too many of us are caught acting as Christians. The life of many Christians today is largely a pretense. They live a spiritual life, talk a spiritual language, and adopt spiritual attitudes, but they're doing the whole thing themselves. Listen to this. He says, it's the effort involved 
that should reveal to them that something is wrong. They force themselves to refrain from doing this, from saying that, from eating the other, and how hard they find it all. And then he gives an example. It's brilliant. He says, it's just the same as when we Chinese try to talk a different language like English that is not our own. No matter how hard we try, it does not come spontaneously. We have to force ourselves to talk that way. But when it comes to speaking our own language, nothing could be easier. Even when we forget all that we're doing, we still speak it. It flows. It comes to us perfectly naturally, and its very spontaneity, re listen, reveals to everyone who we are. Many of you know So-So, my wife, used to babysit little Evie James Atkins. Bless her heart. We heard in our house, I think it was about a million times, let it go, let it go. You guys know that song? Some of you do. Hey, this message is about letting it flow. The life of Jesus in us should just be spontaneous. Look, I'm, I'm like anybody else. Actually, I'm worse than most people. I started to say I'm like anybody else. I'm worse than most people. I find myself straining to the point of breaking. I try so hard. I'm glad Sosa's not sitting here because you'd all look at her if, you, if she was sitting down there. I try so hard. The key, it's wrong. The key is just trusting that Jesus will do within us what he says he'll do. The standard set before us is perfection, nothing less. That's not, this is not about lowering the standard. But we know that's impossible on our own. So we stop trying to be good enough and simply trust in Jesus to do what we can't. Like Paul says elsewhere, it's no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. Friends, you're going to face a challenge this week. You are. Maybe today. Maybe it won't be a person. Uh, maybe it'll be uh, about uh, money uh, or food or maybe some kind of uh, you know, sexual temptation. Maybe you'll struggle with your emotions. Uh, you get angry too easily. Trust Jesus to live his life through you because when we rest in him, the walk becomes less about effort and more about letting his love flow through us naturally. Amen? Does that make sense? Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for the life of Jesus that flows within us. Help us to stop striving in our own strength and instead to trust you to work in and through us. Teach us to surrender, to let go of our efforts, and to allow your spirit to transform our hearts and lives. May we walk in the freedom and joy that only comes from you. We ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing verse 4 of number 296. We have a story to tell the, to the nation. Verse 4. If you will, stand together as we sing. Savior to show to the nation who the path of sorrow hath trod, that all of the world's great people might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God, for the darkness shall turn to to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. There is gladness in my soul today.
This has been a presentation of the Union City Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We're located at 631 East Church Street in Union City, Tennessee. That's at the corner of Home and Church Streets. Come find us. Come find community. Come find your spiritual family where home meets church. Have a great week. We hope to see you again next time.